So uh, welcome back. Thank you for coming back. And uh, the third presentation tonight, uh, we're going to have Dan Esler speaking to us. And Dan is a research biologist with the USGS with the Alaska Science Center here in Anchorage. And uh, he's been working on sea duck research on the Pacific Coast since 1994. He's also a principal investigator with the uh, Gulf Watch Alaska monitoring program. And if uh, for you, for those of you that don't know about the Gulf Watch uh, monitoring program, uh, you should all check it out because it's uh, applicable in Prince William Sound in the Gulf. And it's something that I'm learning more about and uh, just a lot of good science doing, being done through Gulf Watch Alaska. And uh, this isn't Dan's first Science Night Rodeo. He's actually uh, been here in 2015 to talk to us about the recovery of sea ducks and sea otters after EVOS. So he is well versed with our crowd. So thank you, Dan. Thank you. Well, tonight uh, I'm gonna talk about my favorite bunch of birds, the sea ducks, and, uh, and consider a couple of major events that have happened in the northern Gulf of Alaska. Uh, a big oil spill that you're familiar with, and then uh, the more recent marine heat wave phenomenon, and try and contrast the responses uh, of this group of birds to those two different perturbations. And, and then at the end, think about what we might learn in a more general way about how wildlife responds to perturbations of different types and why some animals are more vulnerable to one thing than another and, and how we might predict how different marine organisms might respond to different perturbations in the future. Uh, so first, let's, uh, let's get up close and personal with our sea ducks. Oh, wait, that's a little, that's a little too close. Um, so these are the sea ducks uh, in North America. There are 15 different species of sea ducks. And we're lucky here in Alaska that all of these different sea ducks can occur within our state, uh, which is unique in the US. And so the sea ducks uh, include all kinds of weird and wonderful uh, ducks. It's, uh, we've got eiders like king eiders, stellar eiders, spectacled eiders, common eiders, uh, three different scoters, surf scoters, black scoters, white wing scoters, three mergansers, commons, hooded and red breasted. Uh, we've got the little bufflehead, long-tailed ducks, and harlequin ducks. And these birds all constitute uh, a specific tribe within the waterfowl family. It's called Mergaini, but it's basically uh, sea ducks. And they're well-named because they do spend most of their annual cycle on the ocean. So they truly are marine birds. Whoopsie. Did I just kill it? OK. And don't do it again. <laughs> I'll try and hit the right buttons. Thank you. There we go. OK, so a few things about our friends, the sea ducks. So as I mentioned, they spend most of their annual cycle um, on marine waters. And typically, these species will only go inland to breed. So some of them are tundra breeders. You know, The eiders all breed on tundra habitats. Uh, the scoters typically go into boreal forest wetlands to breed. Harlequin ducks will go onto fast moving mountain streams. So they all go inland to, to um, nest and raise their young, but then come back out to the coast and spend most of their annual cycle in marine waters. And when they're there, um, typically, you know, you can, whoop, ah, I can't believe I did that again. <laughs> um, typically you can find them in big aggregations, you know, uh, depending on whether the food is aggregated, you might see them in, in flocks of hundreds, or even in the case of herring spawn, you see them in thousands to tens of thousands. So they can be in really big groups. Um, by and large, uh, sea ducks mostly eat benthic invertebrates, so um, bivalves like mussels, clams. Uh, they also eat crustaceans, snails, so lots of benthic invertebrates. And that's going to be important, an important part of the um, an important part of the story as we get a little further into the presentation. Um, another thing to note that I think many of you will appreciate, but it's not always obvious to people, is that this group of birds is really an abundant and important part of the bird community um, of our coastal areas. And in fact, um, in the off season, so fall, winter, and spring, uh, sea ducks constitute the largest numbers and largest biomass of birds that are out there. Uh, in South Central and Southeastern Alaska. Uh, 
Um, you, you know, when we think about marine birds, typically the first thing that comes to mind are the, you know, kind of the typical seabirds, the colonial nesting kittiwakes and murres and, and, uh, and puffins and things like that, which is fine. That's the, but that's that's only part of the story. We got to remember that sea ducks constitute an important part of the the bird life out there as well. And also, sea ducks play an important role, kind of in the broader context of what I um, describe as the nearshore ecosystem. And uh, I think it's probably a good idea for me to define exactly what I mean by nearshore ecosystem, so that um, you can follow through with the rest of the presentation. I'm really talking about that area that's uh, that's close to shore, but also that's built uh, that's that's really a, a specific food web. So one that starts with primary productivity that's largely based in in kelps, uh, either either intertidal or shallow subtidal small kelps or bulk kelp or you know bigger bigger kelps. But really, it's uh, that's where the primary productivity starts. Um, the intermediary. Consumers and predators are benthic invertebrates. So, you know, some of the things that I've talked about before, the mussels, the clams, um, and then some predatory invertebrates like sea stars and whelks. And then on up, uh, up the chain to some of these vertebrate predators. So including some fishes, but also things like sea otters, uh, uh, black oyster catchers, and of course, our sea ducks. So the sea ducks are part of this kind of kind of bigger community that, that I'm calling the nearshore community. And that, that's um, contrasted with uh, what I'll talk about as the, the pelagic community or kind of the pelagic biome. So sometimes what we think about as, as kind of the more typical marine community. So it's um, got phytoplankton as its uh, primary productivity base and then up through zooplankton, forage fish to things like uh, the traditional seabirds, seals, sea lions, whales, things like that. So I'm, I'm treating the nearshore community as something kind of separate from uh, pelagic biome. Okay, um, <clears throat> so what I want to walk through with you tonight is uh, a couple things. One, to consider how sea ducks might respond to oil spills and then using the Exxon Valdez as an example of that. And then think a little bit about how sea ducks have responded to this uh, more recent marine heat wave. Um, and then think about, you know, so what, what the mechanism might be for how sea ducks would respond to that. And then finally, to um, use sea ducks as a, as a way to think a little bit about how wildlife um, respond to these perturbations and how different communities might have um, different levels of vulnerability or resilience to different kinds of marine ecosystem perturbations. All right, so let's let's start with oil spills. And uh, you know there there have been plenty of examples of. Um, catastrophic spills that have happened within sea duck habitat. You know, we've got the, the Costco Busan down in San Francisco, the Nestuka that happened off the west coast of Washington and British Columbia, uh, Silandang IU that happened in the Aleutian Islands, and then of course the Exxon Valdez that we're all too familiar with. So these things happen in, in sea duck habitats all the time. And unfortunately, sea ducks uh, are one of the species or one of the groups of birds that are particularly vulnerable, not only to direct effects of the spill, like you see here, you know, sort of the, the awful pictures of oiled wildlife. You know, a lot of times when you see birds, it's sea ducks that are, that are um, affected strongly, but also sea ducks um, have longer term kind of chronic effects from spills that I'll talk about soon. But why is that? What, what makes sea ducks particularly vulnerable to this kind of perturbation? Well, the first thing is simple physics. Um, oil floats, ducks float, and um, they, they end up uh, interacting with each other. Sea ducks typically spend, you know, 90 some percent of their time floating on the water surface. Uh, they don't tend to haul out very much. So <clears throat> if there's any kind of spill, they're always on the water, they're gonna encounter that oil. Uh, the other thing about sea ducks is that they occur and, and forage in either intertidal habitats or shallow subtidal habitats. And it turns out that's exactly where the oil goes when it's not floating anymore. It washes up on shore and really uh, permeates and, and becomes uh, sequestered in, in some of the sediments exactly in the habitat where these animals are trying to feed. 
Um, another thing that makes them especially vulnerable is their consumption of benthic invertebrates. And that, that comes from um, sort of two directions. One, you know, they're kind of poking around in the sediment to get at these different um, prey animals. And in the process of that are disturbing any oil that's there and either getting it externally or consuming it. And then also a lot of these animals are, a lot of these prey are filter feeders. So they're bringing in hydrocarbons and don't have the same sort of detoxification and metabolic processes for getting rid of that oil uh, that vertebrates do. So some of that uh, can be sequestered in their tissues and then the ducks consume the prey and then as a byproduct get some of that uh, hydrocarbon contamination. So that's a problem. Um, the other thing about sea ducks is that they've got really high quality plumage. So they're, they're really well adapted to living in subarctic and arctic environments. You know, that's, that's why it's so great to get a eider down jacket or eider down pillow. It's like these, these sea ducks know how to make uh, insulation. But when that insula, they count on it though. So when that insulation is compromised by, um, by oil or, or any other substance, um, it can have important effects on them. And this, this shows some results from a little experiment uh, at the Alaska Sea Life Center where there was some oil put on harlequin ducks. And it, it shows that even with you know, not much oil, something like that, their metabolic costs really skyrocket. And particularly when they're in water, which is, as I mentioned, where sea ducks spend all of their time. Um, and the second thing is that it also affects their behavior. So this graph shows that they spent, all, those with more oil spent a lot less time resting and a lot more time in maintenance activities. And there are, there are consequences of that. You know, if you're not, um, if you're busy maintaining your plumage, you're not looking for predators, you're um, not getting the rest you need. So, so there are real consequences to behavioral modifications as well. <clears throat> and then finally, um, another important thing is that sea ducks have a life history that, um, you know, some animals live fast, die young, you know, produce a lot of babies, uh, but don't really count on high adult survival to, to um, propagate the species. Uh, sea ducks are different, you know, they, they are long lived, um, they have relatively low reproductive output on an annual basis, and, um, and they really rely on on a high adult survival. Um, so anything that, that, um, that reduces survival of adult members of a species is gonna be uh, particularly troublesome in a, uh, for population dynamics. So there's all these reasons why you would expect sea ducks to be especially vulnerable to an oil spill. And I've got just a, a quick uh, example of harlequin ducks following the Exxon Valdez spill to kind of hammer that point home. Um, Harlequin ducks were chosen to look at in the context of the Exxon Valdez because there was some evidence right out of the gate that they weren't recovering as quickly as some other species. And they have these vulnerabilities that I just talked about that uh, make sea ducks uh, troublesome within oil spills. And the other thing we know is that, um, you know, there was quite a bit of oil that was sequestered in the beaches of Prince William Sound it was an estimate of about 40% of the spilled oil ended up on, on the beaches. And, uh, and we found through some sampling that um, harlequin ducks were exposed to that oil at least through 2011. And that's uh, 22 years after the spill. So this is just, this is just a graph of a, the activity of an enzyme that's induced when, uh, when any vertebrate, you, me, or harlequin ducks are, are exposed to oil. And uh, it was really, uh, really surprising to see that signal persist all the way through 2011. So they were, they were encountering some of this lingering oil for 22 years post spill, which was not expected. And the other thing was that there was some evidence that it was having real important effects on adult survival, which again, I mentioned was um, really important for these kind of long lived species. And this, uh, this just shows a graph um, that describes female survival during the period of 95 to 98. So that's, you know, like seven to 10 years post spill. And in the end, there was a significant difference between birds marked in oiled areas of Prince William Sound relative to unoiled. So there was a, a real survival signal uh, that was almost certainly due to exposure to oil. <clears throat> 
Um, luckily, that signal went away. So by the time you're 13 or 14 years out, that survival signal went away. So, um, so things had gotten back to normal, at least in terms of survival at that time, despite that the birds were still being exposed to oil through this period. Uh, just not uh, apparently enough to cause differences in survival. Um, and this, this shows, you know, what it means in terms of population dynamics. So um, <clears throat> on this axis, there's years after the spill. Um, this is kind of the starting point, the estimated population at the time of the spill. Uh, there were big declines associated with direct effects from the spill and then that kind of longer term suppression of survival. And then uh, things turned around as they, as they were less and less exposed to oil and, and the, the projection was that uh, the population would increase uh, reaching the sort of the pre-spill population in 2013. So again, you know, 20 some years post-spill. So uh, <clears throat> it's in part because of that survival difference that we saw, but also because of, uh, because of just the lag time that uh, along the species takes to, to recover from something like that. Okay, so moving on to, um, <clears throat> to considering how sea ducks might be affected by a more recent phenomenon, so that marine heat wave. I think we're all familiar with the blob, which is, um, this, is a, this is an image from uh, early 2015 that shows anomal anomalously warm water within the Northern um, Pacific, and it's had strong effects on the Gulf of Alaska. Um, this graph shows um, temperature anomalies from 1970 to the present, and this is, this is the blob. So these, this uh, long series of especially high temperatures that are um, notable, not only for the height of the peak, but also the duration over which the, the warm water has, uh, was expressed. So how might that affect a sea duck? Well, it's not going to affect it directly. Um, you know, sea ducks are homeotherms. Um, you know, they, they live in a variety of environments. So a couple of degrees here and there is really probably not going to affect them directly. It's not going to affect their thermodynamics or met metabolic rates that much to make a difference. Uh, but there could be important bottom-up effects uh, that would be important for sea ducks in an indirect way. So by bottom up, I mean, okay, so you've got these sort of climatic and oceanic conditions, um, and that's gonna affect productivity, including kelp that, um, that fuels the, the food web that sea ducks are part of. And that in turn is probably gonna affect some of those intermediary consumers, um, which, uh, you know, a change in prey could very easily, inf and we've got lots of literature in the waterfowl world that shows uh, changes in prey abundance influence things like uh, survival and breeding propensity and all kinds of important demographic things, uh, which in turn affect population dynamics. So in theory, something like a marine heat wave could certainly affect sea ducks. Uh, and we, we see in the real world little bits and pieces of this story played out. So this is an example from the Dutch Wadden Sea where um, and this is influenced somewhat by a, a commercial mussel fishery, but um, when the prey goes away, mortality skyrockets. Not too surprising, uh, but it just demonstrates that that, that mechanism could be at play. And, you know, we kind of see broad correlations between um, changes in conditions in both summer and fall and numbers of nests of common eiders um, in Iceland. So, again, there's this kind of broad correlation that, okay, changes in temperature might have this trickle up effect to, to some of these top predators, but the exact intermediate links that, if, that, uh, that link changing oceans to changing prey to changing duck populations are still a bit mysterious. And here's just another example where, um, you know, change in sea ice was correlated with numbers of nests of a different population of common eider. So, you know, there, there are these broad scale things that are probably at play. Uh, one of my colleagues, Paul Flint, uh, at the Alaska Science Center has looked at, um, a little closer to home, looked at some of these broad regime shifts and has found that there are correlations between uh, population dynamics of a few species of ducks um, associated with those different regime shifts. So again, you know, these big picture oceanographic changes um, 
are correlated with these population changes, but you know, the exact mechanisms are not exactly clear. Um, so what do we know from, from this more recent um, heat wave? And thanks Austin for calling out Gulf Watch Alaska, appreciate that. Um, so Gulf Watch Alaska is a, is a marine monitoring program that includes uh, some oceanographic work, some um, more pelagic oriented work, and then our nearshore component. So we're monitoring all kinds of things from kelp to invertebrates to sea otters to, to sea ducks and other marine birds. And so this gives us some insights as to whether we might actually see responses of sea ducks to this um, kind of broad scale marine heat wave. And just another graph to, to prove that, yeah, the marine heat wave is relevant to the environments in which these sea ducks live. These are intertidal data uh, from four different regions where we work, Western Prince William Sound, Kenai Fjords, Kachemak Bay, and Katmai. And all of them show this signal of the blob in that uh, 2015 to 2017 range. So right up against shore, we're seeing, um, seeing this blob being expressed in terms of temperature variation. Okay, but what does that what does that temperature variation mean to you know the next step up in the food web? Well, there's a few uh, few examples here where we see um, kind of broad scale and consistent changes in a number of key elements of intertidal systems. So this fucus um, popweed essentially it's a it's a dominant intertidal kelp, and uh, we've seen across the board declines in in abundance of Fucus um, associated with the timing of the, the occurrence of the blob. Uh, we've seen pretty uh, dramatic sea star changes in a lot of the um, places where we work, and that's somewhat attributed to um, increasing water temperatures, exacerbating uh, sea star wasting disease. So there are a lot of, uh, a lot of evidence that sea stars have been wiped out by that. And then finally, um, We've seen increases in muscles associated with the blob. What we haven't seen is strong responses by sea ducks. So, um, you know, kind of flat lines in terms of harlequin duck numbers over time, uh, pretty, fl pretty flat numbers in uh, winter for a couple of different species. So it doesn't seem to be having a strong effect on duck populations, interestingly enough. And this same, this same pattern has been shown in uh, and sea otters and black oyster catchers too. So other um, top nearshore predators aren't, aren't showing these big responses. Um, in contrast, we have seen really strong responses in a lot of animals from the pelagic community. So things like um, kittiwakes and humpback whales and other top predators. So the pelagic's obviously responding very differently. And I think that's largely because the food web's being altered more markedly. So we've seen crashes in, uh, in lots of different forage fish, changes in uh, lipid composition of lots of forage fish. So the, the, the things that really fuel that food web have changed a lot. And that's, I guess I wanna close with that, just recognizing that these different biomes, these different parts of the marine community are affected differently. So in this case, you know, maybe nearshore communities are way more affected by contaminant spills, but less by marine heat waves and vice versa. You know, if we're concerned about changing climatic conditions, we might expect to see responses in the pelagic community before we see it in the, in the nearshore community. Um, and so I better stop there because I'm already over time, I think. <laughs> uh, but happy to entertain any questions or comments at this point. I was interested in knowing whether you saw any effects um, over the summer from the atmospheric heat wave. Uh, you know, we saw a lot of effects with the, um, the streams, of course, coming off the land and everything. And I, and I didn't know if the change in water quality or the reduction in freshwater influence would have any sort of um, influence on the marine community as well. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, I think we might see that but not until next year so um, most of the intertidal sampling that I'm involved with happens kind of late May and June um, 
and you know this summer's heat uh, went well beyond that time. Um, you know, there's lots of mechanisms by which that could affect intertidal animals. So, you know, if it gets too hot, um, you know, it's it's uh, especially those that are in the higher part of the intertidal, they can desiccate and die. Um, yeah, that lack that change in the freshwater input could have effects on the community. Uh, but I don't. I, I'll be real curious when we go out next year to see if we see that expressed in kind of what's left when we come back. Um, so yeah, that's a that's an interesting point. Uh, to come back to oil spills, um, I come from Brittany where we have had a disastrous series of uh, oil spills all through the 70s and the 80s. Uh, last week on the northern shore, uh, people started finding uh, oil birds that were dying. And so they were sent to uh, rehab centers who sent some of the dead birds to the lab to analyze the oil. The oil is coming from the wreck of the Tanyo, which could not be emptied completely because it's uh, so deep in a canyon. That wreck was in 1980, in January 1980. Gives you an idea of how long it lingers. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a significant issue. And I guess one of the things I should have mentioned uh, that's relevant to your comment is that all the things that make sea ducks vulnerable to catastrophic spills also makes them vulnerable to, to chronic pollution, whether it's you know oil leaking out of a, a grounded vessel or um, just just uh, you know in more urban areas stuff that washes off the street and washes off pilings. You know, sea ducks are uh, high on the list of things that would be affected by stuff like that. I saw one of your slides had um, there was a it was in the Dutch Sea. You showed that when the uh, when the when the mussels crashed, uh, that the, the the ducks also crashed. But then one of your later slides showed the mussels increasing with the Pacific decadal oscillation, but the duck population didn't rebound as well. So I was just wondering if you could speculate on that. Like, it doesn't seem like an elastic relationship. Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely not a linear relationship. So um, I think in a lot of cases. Uh, what's happening here is that um, winter food is not limiting, so it doesn't uh, that that change in muscles that we see really doesn't translate to a population change in ducks because it's not the limiting factor. I think there are lots of other things that are probably constraining sea duck populations um, that that would override food abundance until you get to the point where you see something catastrophic like what happened in the Wadden Sea where food essentially went away and the ducks were left with nothing. And, and you know, um, there have been examples in the literature from Puget Sound too, where, you know, there are big flocks of sea, uh, surf scoters that kind of move around Puget Sound and they'll eat down one place and then they'll move to the next and eat it down. But at some point they run out of places. And so there's been some evidence that, uh, that food can be a constraint under those circumstances. So it really just kind of depends on, you know, what the limiting factor is at any particular time and place. Are these ducks susceptible to plastic contamination? Uh, they could be um, because um, people are coming to appreciate how microplastics are being uptaken by filter feeding invertebrates that they subsequently consume. But that question has never been asked in, in sea ducks. And as far as I know, not in any other kind of high end um, or higher predators within that food web. So yeah, it's an open question. But, but the uh, potential mechanism is certainly there. Um, how long will you be doing this research um, you know, studying these, I mean, is it a ongoing annual for your career or? Uh, Hopefully the... longer than that. <laughs> okay, so, so, so it isn't, um, uh, there isn't an end in sight. So um, there is to my career. <laughs> uh, We're talking ducks. Oh, okay. Um, the, um, 
So the Exxon Valdez Oilsville Trustee Council is funding this Gulf Watch Marine Monitoring Program, something I should have mentioned at the outset. Um, and the vision of that is that it was intended to be a 20 year monitoring program. And we're, I think in year eight now, so at least another 12 years and, and hopefully there's uh, some scope to carry that on. And in part, because I really think we're at the point where we're generating lots of interesting data about lots of different parts of the Northern Gulf of Alaska. And we're just at the point now where we're starting to really be able to harvest the fruits of all that labor. You know, we're, we're starting to see really interesting patterns. We can start to correlate them with, uh, you know, with bottom up drivers. Um, we're, we're, you know, these long term data are so valuable for for putting into context things like oil spills and marine heat waves because you have the the scope to be able to to put them into a bigger context. So it's uh, yeah, here's hoping it uh, goes on for even longer. You mentioned um, May and June. Um, is it just those two months, or is it a 12 month a year? Or? Well, there's that. Uh, so speaking of Gulf Watch broadly, there's activity all year long. Um, the 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 May and June part I was talking about was really only the intertidal monitoring uh, for um, you know like the benthic invertebrates and the and the algaes and the things that might be affected by I think it was called the, the <laughs> atmospheric heat wave. But there are there are other activities happening all year long that are related to to this Gulf Watch program. You know, oceanographic data that are being collected year year round. Um, you know, we've got bird surveys that happen during the winter. Uh, so yeah, lots of stuff is happening at different times of year all over the North Gulf Coast. So I just was wondering if you have any statistics about traditional areas where these birds are and the impacts from population of people as far as uh, their effects on... Yeah, that's a great question. Um, certainly not in Alaska. And, and it's... Uh, well, that was one of the one of the things that we learned in the case of the Exxon Valdez, right? Is that we really don't have great baseline data for almost anything, especially in Alaska. You know, we really have no context to, um, you know, from before '89 in Prince William Sound, for example, there were only a handful of bird surveys that uh, that had happened prior to the spill, and we, we know a heck of a lot more now. Um, uh, and yeah, in terms of you know human activity, that's that's a tough one because in a lot of places, sea ducks have shown themselves to be pretty tolerant of uh, living you know near human activity, so they they can uh, they can acclimate to that in some cases. Well, I'm just gonna cut that off for now, just so that we get our next presentation. But thank you so much, Dan. If you have any more questions for Dan, please catch him afterwards or off in the hall there. So thank you, Dan, very much. Thank you. Thank you.